Uh, hello guys, and this is Scott here, and welcome to another historic weather video, and in fact this is the first historical video of 2016. Um, and in this one I've actually been asked to have a look at the winter and spring of 1916-17, uh, or as it's more commonly known as, the severe winter of the Great War. Um, and as its name implies, it was a very cold and prolonged winter in the middle of the First World War. Um, and it's actually more famously known because of the bitterly cold spring that followed it as well. It wasn't just the winter that was very cold. Um, and as I said, this was a suggestion of one of my viewers. So uh, thank you very much to him, actually, because this really is a very interesting choice. And so thank you for that. So before we get started, I'd just like to say that many of the facts and figures that we hear in this video come from Trevor Harley's personal weather website. Um, he has an archive of weather information going back to the medieval times in some cases. It's a fantastic resource for getting information about almost every month really. Um, and also the charts that you see in this video come from the historical archive at wettercentral.d. They have an archive of charts going back to the 1st of January 1871. So as I always say to everyone watching, if you want to suggest a historic video, it can be of any weather event, month, season, from the start of 1871. And I can have a look at it in one of these videos. So we're going to start on the 1st of December 1916, so that's the first day of the meteorological winter. And already there, you can already see it looks pretty interesting straight away as we have that big area of high pressure over parts of Eastern Europe and that will play a part a bit later on in the month. And also we've got the Azores High, which is normally around Spain and France. That's actually pulled out into the mid-Atlantic. So it's almost allowing there a cold pattern to develop straight away. And actually as we go through the first and into the second, you can see that we actually bring up a bit of a southeasterly there from that area of high pressure over Eastern Europe. Now at this point it's actually not too cold because that wind's coming up from parts of the Mediterranean so it's not too cold at this stage. And that goes on into the third before we actually get a little bit of a northerly blast around the fourth as we have an area of low pressure to the north just stretching down. Um, and that goes on into the 5th, before high pressure actually builds through the country and gets up towards Scandinavia by the 6th. So again, this is just allowing things to turn a little bit colder. And so by the time we get to the 7th of December, we're actually starting to get into a bit more of a block pattern there. So the mild westerlies are slowly being blocked from the UK, and we're allowing, at this point, more inversion-type coal to set up. So inversion is basically when we have mild air aloft, but pretty cold air at the surface, which is to be expected because in December the sun is really very weak. So stagnant air, what you get under high pressure systems, you know, gives temperature inversions. And that really goes on into the 8th, before we get a bit of an Atlantic interlude around the 9th. But you can already see that that high pressure is starting to retrogress up towards Greenland. Um, and for those who don't know, I always have to assume that you're watching this for the first time. Retrogression is basically the opposite of the zonal flow. So normally low pressure systems, but it can happen with highs, move across the North Atlantic from west to east. So, you know, they start off over the Canadian seaboard, move across the mid-Atlantic and move up towards Scandinavia and into Europe that's the zonal flow. Now retrogression is the opposite of that so normally high pressure systems, it's normally highs that retrogress, will move from west to east. So we will see, um, sorry, east to west I should say. So normally we'll see um, highs move from Europe and usually into around the mid-Atlantic and that's normally a sign of cold weather for the UK. And so as we get through to the 10th of December, you can already see now that that high has got up to Greenland and it's starting to bring a bit more of a cold northerly down over the country. 
and that low pressure that's been around us is starting to dive away to the south. So, you know, we're starting to entrench colder air over the country now. And as we go through to the 11th and into the 12th, that low pressure then sits just to the south of the country and we're bringing in, we're entrenching, as I said, cold air into that trough. So we're bringing temperatures down, you know. By this point, daytime temperatures are quite close to freezing and nights are getting colder. But because we're also under that low pressure, there's also quite a lot of snow showers around. So, you know, it's a very seasonable, you know, a traditionally seasonable run up to Christmas, as you'd say. So a very seasonable December. And that goes on into the 13th and into the 14th, where we actually start to turn it more and more cold. And again, we get more snow. And that goes on into the 15th and the 16th. And actually, I've got a few pictures to show in this video. So um, there is actually a picture of some British troops from the 16th of December, 1916, can you believe? Um, and as I said, remember, this was during the First World War. So, you know, looking back at this, it was an interesting winter, a very interesting winter. But, you know, for those alive at the time and fighting in the trenches, it would have been a real, real bitter and atrocious winter. And actually, as we go through into the 17th of December, um, it actually gets more and more severe. So that Greenland block starts to set up even stronger and we actually start to bring a cold northeasterly into the country by this point. So temperatures continue to fall away. Um, and we go, that goes on into the 18th and the 19th of December, 1916. And actually, and so those are the upper air temperatures on the 19th of December. And actually, surprisingly, they're not bitterly cold upper air temperatures. They are cold enough for winter air and snow, as the minus 5 Celsius isotherm is through the whole country. But just like in summer, the longer we build up, the longer those upper air temperatures stay over the country, the colder it gets. It's exactly the same in summer as it is in winter. And that's actually what we see in this winter. And then as we get towards the 20th, you see that low pressure actually starts to move a bit further north then. So we start to cut off that northeasterly. So very slowly we do start to turn it a little bit milder as we go into the run up to Christmas. But there's actually still a lot of cold air entrenched in that trough. So it actually takes a lot, quite a while for it to turn milder. So as we go through the 21st and into the 22nd, we actually keep those snow showers around the country. And that goes on into the 23rd and into Christmas Eve. As I said, you know, very slowly each day turning a little bit milder. So by this point, you know, the snow's mostly turning back to rain. So, you know, we do turn it milder just in time for Christmas itself so there is Christmas Day and that goes on into Boxing Day 1916 and then even with that very cold start we actually turn it very mild so actually on the 27th and into the 28th we actually build the Azores high into Spain and France and we actually bring up this very long fetch southwesterly wind so in these last couple of days of December we actually go from sub-zero temperatures and quite widespread snow to actually mid-teens Celsius. So, you know, a real contrast to an otherwise bitterly cold month. And even with, as I said, even with this very mild spell, the CET is still only 1.9 degrees. So, you know, it just shows really how good the cold was in the middle of the month, how potent it was to not really be affected too much by this very mild spell. And really that's where we finish December, so as we go through the 29th into the 30th and into New Year's Eve, you know, we keep that very mild southwesterly going. And then we go into New Year's Day 1917, so there is the 1st of January, and again we keep that mild weather. But despite this mild start, January 1917 has a central England temperature of 1.6 degrees so again that is a very cold winter month um, and it actually is famous because 
During this cold spell, the cold spell that arrives in the month, the River Mersey in the northwest of England that runs past Liverpool, you know, empties into the, the Irish Sea at Liverpool, partially froze during this month. It didn't freeze completely, but, you know, it was a very significant freeze of this river. Um, and you'll see why as we get further in, because as we go through the second and into the third, we do keep it mild, but, you know, very slowly as we go through into the third and the fourth of January, that Azores high then starts to pull out into the mid-Atlantic. And you can see again, it's trying to retrogress up to Greenland. So there on the 4th of January, we're starting to turn around into a colder northwesterly wind there. And as we get through into the 5th, again, we're slowly starting to drag in colder air. You know, we're getting low pressure again over Scandinavia and the high pressure is building through the mid-Atlantic. So again, we're turning it colder. And as we go through into the 6th and into the 7th, you know, it's getting more and more severe. Again, the Greenland high is building on the 7th. And as we go through into the 8th and the 9th of January, there again, we're into another bitterly cold winter pattern. Um, and this day, the 9th and into the 10th of January, these were very cold days. In fact, bitterly cold days. Um, it wasn't just the cold northeastly, but look how tight those isobars there on the 9th of January. You know, we're actually getting gale force northeasterlies on this day. So it really is a viciously cold winter's day. You know, it's also very cloudy as well this period. So, um, you know, really feeling raw and extremely grim, especially, you know, for those fighting in the trenches and, you know, the general population. It really must have been an atrocious winter at the time. And that goes on into the 10th and into the 11th of January. We actually bring a bit of snow in there on the 11th of January as we bring an area of low pressure into that cold air. But again, as that low clears away into the 12th, we turn the winds back into the north. So again, we get another shot of cold Arctic air. And that goes on into the 13th. And into the 14th, and again by the 14th, we bring that bitter northeasterly wind back. Um, and the 14th, again, was partic another particularly cold day. Um, and it was very cloudy with outbreaks of snow. We had a lot of, you know, snow showers building up on the east coast this day. So again, you know, very, very cold and very wintry. You know, looking back at this, it's actually um, no surprise that this is really is a famous winter. And that goes on into the 15th. And then as we go into the 16th, we actually bring um, an area of low pressure from the Atlantic up against that block. So across the southern half of the country, we actually get some very heavy snow on the 16th of January, 1917. And in fact, we get five inches of snow at Newquay in Cornwall. So, you know, even the very tip of Cornwall is getting its taste of this bitterly cold weather. And, you know, those are the upper air temperatures on the 16th of January. So, again, you know, the minus 5 Celsius isotherm is across the whole country. And we're even bringing in the minus 10 Celsius isotherm into the northeast of the country. So, again, you know, no surprise why it's bitterly, bitterly cold with those northeasterly winds blasting through the country. And then, you know, there's no change as we go through into the 17th and the 18th We actually start to build that high pressure to the north there on the 18th. So again, you know, we just get another cold shot of easterlies. You know, that goes on into the 19th. Before, by the 20th, we actually build up, start to build up a real Scandinavian high there. So, you know, this cold pattern's just becoming more and more entrenched, basically. And it's getting more and more blocked and severe. And, you know, again, into the 21st, we're bringing up snow showers into the eastern coastlines it's still very cloudy as well um, so again you know the rawness goes on into the 22nd and the 23rd of January and again there's no change into the 24th and the 25th before by the 26th again we bring low pressure into that and we get another day of heavy snow on the 26th of January 1917 so again it just goes on and on and on 
you know, again, we keep those snow showers in the, to the 27th and the 28th. As that wind actually swings around more into a southeasterly there on the 28th. So, um, you know, the continent as well is bitterly cold. And again into the 29th and the 30th. And that's where we actually finish off January 1917. We actually swing those winds back into a northeasterly. So again, it you know, just stays bitterly, bitterly cold throughout this month. And again, those are some more pictures. So we actually have some of the soldiers in a the trench there. And this is from, this is from January 1917. Uh, so again, you know, just shows really how bleak it was this winter for these fighting in the trenches. And you know, no surprise why so many of them got trench foot. And again, there's another one. I'm not sure whether this one's from December or January, but again, you can just see more British soldiers and workmen just trying to clear the snow away, really, from this winter. And again, it goes on into February, can you believe? So again, on the 1st of February 1917, we keep that northerly to northeasterly again, blasting through the country. It stays bitterly cold. And February 1917 is the coldest month of the winter, with a central England temperature of just plus 0 0.9 degrees. So again, it's a very, very cold winter month. And actually, the first 10 days of February is actually the most severe part of the winter. Throughout the first week, we actually see temperatures widely down to minus 10 Celsius overnight. So it really is just bitterly, bitterly cold. And you know that goes on, and those are the upper air temperatures there on the 1st of February. You know, the minus 10 Celsius isotherm is across really the whole of England and Wales. Um, and we're actually even bringing the minus 15 quite close to the southeast. So again, it's just extraordinarily cold, really. And you know, no change into the 2nd and the 3rd. We actually bring a bit more snow in there on the 3rd of February. And that goes on into the 4th, before we get another northerly shot on the 5th. Um, and actually in the early hours of the 6th of January, as the isobars actually slacken and winds fall light, we actually record minus 20 Celsius at Benson in Oxfordshire. So again, you know, it's bitterly, bitterly cold. I can't say bitterly cold enough. And actually then on the 7th of February, um, Benson actually doesn't get above minus 5 degrees Celsius, you know, again in those very slack winds and under the heavy cloud that's there as well, you know, it's still this cold under the cloud, you know, so it really is a severely cold winter. And really there's no change as we go into the 8th and the 9th of February 1917. We keep those easterly through the country and we keep the anticyclonic set up. So again, into the 10th and the 11th, it just stays very, very cold, very bitter, and again, very frosty and foggy during this period. Really, that goes on into the 12th and the 13th of February. Um, it's becoming a little bit less cold by this point. It's still pretty, it is, it is still cold, don't get me wrong on that, but you know, we're losing the severe cold by the 13th and into the 14th of February. As actually we're starting to then bring the winds up a bit more from the Mediterranean. So, you know, that area is cold in winter, but, you know, not as was cold in this winter, I should say. But, you know, just bringing slightly milder air by this point. And that goes on into the 15th and the 16th of February where the Atlantic actually has another go on the 16th of February. So we get another day of heavy snow. You know, a weather front comes up against that block and deposits more very heavy snow across the western half of the country. So, you know, it goes on and on and on, I'm afraid. And again, that goes on into the 17th. Before, by the 18th now, we do start to turn into a bit more of a milder pattern. As you know, that block's starting to, you know decay away now and we're starting to bring a bit more of a westerly influence in because by the time we get to the 19th you can see you know we are starting to bring the Azores high back so you know that's normally a sign of that's 
pretty much always a sign of a cold pattern coming to an end. And you know, there we are on the 20th and into the 21st. This actually brings um, some rain, actually. So it's actually the first time we see rain and not snow for quite a while. Before, by the 22nd, we do actually try to turn it cold again as we get this little block to the north of Scotland. So, again, sort of the 23rd into the 24th, we go back into sort of this inversion-type cold where we get warm air aloft, but, you know, cold at the surface. So we go back to this frosty, foggy, cloudy sort of cold winter setup. And again, really, that goes on into the... That's where we finish off February, really. So into the 25th and the 26th, you know, we get another surge of high pressure. And that goes on into the 27th, and that's where we end February 1917. And then we go into March 1917, and normally in these um, winter videos, I would normally be saying that winter would be drawing to a close by this point. You know, we might see another little cold snap or something but by this point winter's days will be pretty numbered by this point but was that the case this year no it certainly wasn't because march 1917 is a very cold march with a central england temperature of just 3.2 degrees now it's actually not quite as cold as the severely cold march of 2013 but in the whole of the 20th century, this was actually the second coldest match of the 20th century, beaten only by 1962. So again, you know, winter shows no signs of letting up as we go into March. And so we start off on the 1st of March, um, and we, again, we just have that anti-cyclonic weather. Um, it's a little bit on the milder side at the moment as we try to bring westerlies in. But that doesn't really last long because as we get into the 2nd of March, you can see again that high pressure is trying to get up to Scandinavia. And by the 3rd of March, we're again bringing easterly winds. Well, we're trying to bring easterly winds back in there. And by the 4th, you know, we go into a real battleground situation there on the 4th. So again, we get some very heavy snow on the 4th of March before... By the 5th of March, again, that low starts to undercut that high. So by the 5th and into the 6th, we start to bring those easterly winds back through the country. And again, as we go into the 7th, those easterlies come through. And then this part, we went very cold. In fact, the 8th of March, 1917, was a bitterly cold day. In fact, many temperatures didn't get above, you know, freezing for most of the days. And when I show you the air temperatures there on the 8th, it's no surprise why. Just look at those upper air temperatures. You know, the minus 10 Celsius isotherm is pretty much across the whole country. And we're even bringing minus 15 into parts of the northeast. So it really is exceptionally cold for early March. And again, we keep it bitterly cold into the 9th before we bring some very heavy snow in on the 10th of March as Atlantic weather systems come up against that, that cold air. And that snow goes on into the 11th before we do turn it a little bit milder then into sort of this middle part of March. So, you know, the 12th and into the 13th, we actually go quite wet actually during this part. Um, so again, by the 14th, you know, temperatures are a little bit more average. But again, you know, by the 15th, we're threatening to turn it colder once again. You know, we're building that northern block in again around Greenland and Iceland. And by the 16th of March, you know, again, we're trying to get high pressure towards Scandinavia. But actually, it doesn't quite happen this time as we sort of just bring a bit of a milder southwesterly in on the 17th and the 18th. So, you know, a couple days of milder weather before, again, you know, by the 19th, that high pressure retrogresses up towards Greenland. And by the 20th of March, we're again back into a very cold northerly wind. In fact, again, there we're actually into gale force northerlies as we bring a tight area of low pressure into the North Sea. So again, you know, bitterly cold for springtime. And that cold northerly goes on into the 21st and we actually see again some very cold air coming down. 
So again, on the 21st into the 22nd, you know, again, no change really. The 23rd, and those are the upper air temperatures again on the 23rd. And you can see, you know, the whole country once again is in very cold air. And then we know we go back to cold anticyclonic into the 24th and the 25th before we get another big gnarly shot by the 26th. So, you know, the winter just shows absolutely no signs of ending. You know, the severe cold just goes on and we're bringing snow showers once again through down the eastern side of the country on the 26th. And, you know, again, we get another snow event as we go through into the 27th and the 28th as low pressure bumps into that cold air. That goes on into the 29th before again by the 30th we're just bringing another you know another gnarly shot into the country and that goes on into the last day of March 1917. Now did April bring an end to it? No it certainly didn't. In fact April 1917 has a central England temperature of just 5.4 degrees which actually makes it the fifth coldest April in terms of the central England temperature. And so it's the fifth coldest April since it's, you know, since a record that goes back to the mid 1600s. So it really is an extraordinarily cold month. And, and you know, it's cold really right from the very start. So the 1st of April, um, we actually have sub zero C maximas in most of the northern half of the country. So, you know, Temperatures at this time of the year, you know, not getting above freezing at all for many areas, which is really quite extraordinary when you know when the fact is the sun at this time of the year is at about the same level as it is in, you know, mid to early September. So it really is, you know, an extraordinary feat this. And then as we go into the 2nd of April on the morning of the 2nd, we actually record a minus 15 degree temperature at Newton Rig in Cumbria, in Cumbria. And that still is the coldest April temperature ever recorded in the UK. So again, it's just an exceptional start to an exceptional month. And as we go through into the evening hours of the second, that area of low pressure deepens and overnight, second into third, we get a massive blizzard across the southern half of the country. You know, look how tight those isobars are. And again, I'll show you the upper air temperatures there on the 3rd of April. You know, we're getting heavy snow in the places that's outside the minus 5 isotherm. It snowed due to evaporative cooling. So again, you know, the winter just won't let up. It just refuses to let up. And um, for those fighting in the war, you know, the grimness just carries on and on and on and shows absolutely no relent. And again, that goes on into the 4th and the 5th of April. We know we keep that very cold air over the country. And in fact, I should say that the first 10 days of April, you know, if a 5.2 Celsius CET wasn't good enough, the first, ten, the first 10 days of April 1917 have a central England temperature of just 2.1 degrees. So, you know, again, it's just extraordinarily and absurdly cold for, this, for the middle of spring now. And that goes on into the 6th and the 7th of April before, again, by the 8th of April, we bring another deep area of low pressure into the country so we get yet more heavy snow and that turns the winds into another gale force northerly by the 9th of April. And that goes on into the 10th. So again, you know, just staying bitterly, bitterly cold like it has been since the start of December. And again, that goes on into the 11th and the 12th of April where we get another blizzard on the 12th. And actually, I should say that during the early hours of the 11th of April, we actually recorded minus 13.3 at Braemar. So again, you know, more extraordinarily cold temperatures. And you know, the 13th and into the 14th, we bring yet more snow into the country before winds turn back into the north by the 15th. 
So, you know, just, you know, same old story, it's cold. And before by the 16th and into the 17th, we finally start to get a bit more of a moderation. So an area of low pressure clears through on the 17th and into the 18th. And that then turns winds into a bit, into a very slightly milder northwesterly. So it stays very cold, but, you know, a little bit milder than what it has been. And that goes on into the 19th and the 20th of April before by the 21st actually that high pressure builds in. So we still get the cold nights with this but we actually lose the very cold days. Because don't forget by this point you know the sun is at the same as it is in the end of August now. So you know the days quickly warm up regardless of the air mass. So you know finally we're starting to get some relief as we go into the last third of April. Again, we keep that anti-cyclonic weather into the 22nd and the 23rd, so we're starting to bring a thaw now into the 24th of April. Before, on the 25th, you know, we actually do start to get a very slight northerly there again, so we turn it a bit colder again. Before the high pressure collapses through on the 26th, and actually again on the 27th and into the 28th of April, we actually at the time threatened another very cold plunge from the north but as you see on the 29th that just didn't happen because high pressure actually collapsed into Europe so that just kept us slightly milder and that's where we finish off April 1917 so again it was you know a bitterly cold month and in fact one last statistic for that month um, Sunderland in the northeast actually had 11 days of lying snow in this month so now that's what you'd normally expect in January, not the middle of spring. And actually there's the chart for the 1st of May 1917. And actually in total contrast to March and April, May 1917 was actually a very warm month. Uh, this actually has a central England temperature of 12.8 degrees. And it was actually a very warm and fine month. So it was very settled there as you can see from that area of high pressure. Um, I'm not going to show the charts for it, but, you know, it was just finally a bit of relief from that utterly cold spring and winter. You know, finally, for those fighting in the First World War, and, you know, just the general public that really suffered in this winter, we finally, in May, bring the winter, the extended winter, to an end. And spring finally arrives. Um, so yeah, I actually hope you enjoyed that look at the winter of 1916-17. As I said, do keep your requests coming in. And so thanks for watching this historic video, guys. And I'll see you next time.